democracy. Democracy is perhaps a counterintuitive keyword in the current pandemic, especially since the acute health crisis has very rapidly brought about a major shift in the political imaginary that privileges virological and epidemiological rationalities and the various public health strategies organized around them. Indeed, the justifications that are being offered for the emergency measures taken in so many places rarely appeal to democratic arguments at all. Instead, the logic that is being articulated is that of public health, of life, and of reducing the morbidity from the disease, in short, a bios political perspective that in many ways invokes values and processes at the biosocial level of the body and the population, rather than traditional democratic principles of liberty and equality, collective autonomy, shared power, citizenship, and self-government. Yet if we want to understand the political perspectives, both in the medium and the long term, we have to look at the current moment from a democratic perspective. Democracy typically refers to a particular system of government, a regime formally defined by popular sovereignty, constitutionalism, the rule of law, a representative government that operates largely by majority rule, and whose key officials are determined by means of free and competitive elections. But in contemporary critical theory, democracy also has a second, broader meaning. In various intellectual traditions, including certain strands of Marxism and radical democratic theory, democracy stands not for a particular regime type or political form, but rather for a struggle, a struggle that is both theoretical and practical against the forms of political domination that are embedded in the state and its institutions. A struggle in the name of a political universalism. Such a struggle is animated both by a normative principle and a historical tendency that seek the extension in both scale and scope of the democratic promise, namely liberty and equality for all, the expansion of the protections of citizenship and of the substantive meaning of autonomy and shared power to those who remain excluded from the demos. This second, more fundamental sense of democracy thus involves a permanent problematization of democracy's internal and external limits and borders. It raises the question of both the nature and form of rule that democracy represents, as well as that of the subject of that rule, the demos and its limits, who belongs and who doesn't. But it also addresses the tendency of democratic regimes and institutions to decay and to enter into crisis, and thus poses the problem of what has been called the democratization of democracy. By conceiving democracy, not as a political form or regime, but rather as a mode of subjectivation and contestation, these critical approaches have offered a considerable challenge to dominant trends in democratic theory. By offering a radical critique of the state and of sovereignty as the forms of modern democracy, these theories have called into question the nature of democratic authority, and have sought to conceptualize democracy as a constitutively unfinished project that is structurally separate from and irreducible to the state apparatus. However, as critics have noted, the conceptualization of democracy as a history and movement of insurrections also has its limits, particularly when any institutional form of political action is by virtue of that very form, regarded as a betrayal of the democratic moment and its logic of equality. One might add, with a view to the current moment, that the fundamental opposition to political forms, to institutions and to the state, robs radical democratic theory of some theoretical avenues to conceptualize or criticize the governmental responses to the pandemic. Here, I propose to understand institutional and insurrectionary conceptions of democracy not as alternatives, but as complementary, in the dialectical sense that the insurrectionary moment has a teleological dimension that tends to institutionalization, and vice versa, that the institutionalized form is both the product of insurrectionary movements and in turn gives rise to them. This double perspective means that the democratic challenges to the pandemic have to be examined both with respect to democracy as a mode of rule and with regards to the prospects for movements that seek to democratize democracy.
Some commentators are framing the current moment as an authoritarian danger. The emergency legislations passed in response to the pandemic permit, so the argument goes, previously unthinkable forms of executive usurpation. Some examples include Hungary, where Prime Minister Viktor Orban has received parliamentary consent to rule by decree indefinitely. Britain, where ministers have unprecedented powers to detain people and to shut down borders. Thailand, which in its state of emergency declaration imposed press restrictions and media censorship. The time frame for the social lockdowns that we're currently experiencing is indeterminate. And this indeed poses democratic concerns, especially in view of epidemiological prognoses, according to which the pandemic could continue for up to one or two years until drugs or vaccines can be developed in sufficient quantities. But I would argue that in addition, there were significant worries for Democrats elsewhere. The widespread ban on public assembly, the utilitarian and functionalist logics that frame current decision making, the lure of government by expertise, and the commodified nature of solidarity that is being invoked. To begin with the issue of public assembly, the prohibitions on public gatherings make protests, demonstrations and strikes all but impossible at the present moment. At a historical juncture, when massive protests and insurrectionary movements have been shaking Algeria, India, Hong Kong, Chile, France and Lebanon, these restrictions on the freedom of association are functioning as effective counter-insurrectionary measures, intensifying and further militarizing the repressive forces brandished against protesters. In India, the sudden declaration of a lockdown and suspension of all transport services has led to the largest wave of mass migration across the country since partition. In Europe, protests are dispersed and criminalized, including protests against the EU's treatment of migrants, against Europe's isolationist policy, its indifference to the plight of refugees caged in internment camps in Greece, and against the militarization of European borders. The restrictions on public assembly undermine collective political agency and severely curtail the possibilities for active collective citizenship. They hit the most vulnerable and critical juncture of social movements, namely the point where people gather collectively in public and form a basic solidarity that is fundamental to democratic movements. Even creative protests that explicitly seek to maintain social distancing measures by spreading participants far apart from one another are being broken up and are subject to oppression and prosecution. Not surprisingly, police forces are interpreting their new powers very loosely, arresting organizers and suppressing many forms of assembly that pose no obvious epidemiological risk. For example, police in the German city of Hamburg have prohibited people in public squares from drawing chalk outlines of their feet to show solidarity with migrants and refugees. The restrictions on public assembly are only the most obvious anti-democratic measures. The imposition of quarantine, the requirements to carry identification and to justify every absence from one's residence are severe curtailments, not only of individual rights, but of the fundamentally relational practices that make us human, understood as social and political beings. Here, I think, it is important to expand the view beyond liberal constitutional rights to a perspective that takes into account the social dimension of freedom. Quarantines and lockdowns are not just forms of house arrest that constitute a deprivation of the classic constitutional rights, such as freedom of movement, of religion, of commerce, and so on. They also pose drastic restrictions on social freedoms, on family forms that exceed the normative frame of the nuclear bourgeois family, on friendships, on intimate relationships that take place outside the household, on cultural life and on the public sphere. It is interesting how little opposition has been provoked by the near total suspension of social freedom. If one looks at contemporary debates, it seems that concerns with the freedom of commerce are much more important. The general framework of debate for the counter epidemic measures seems to be one of public health versus the economy. Here the discourse around children is particularly revealing, for they figure in the public debates primarily as vectors of disease and as burdens for parents. It is striking, for example, that the primary motivation to reopen schools and daycares in Denmark, Norway and Germany is to relieve parents of having to homeschool 
and supervise their children, and thus be able to reintegrate themselves into the labor process. When the needs of children come up in these debates at all, it is typically in the form of a need for education, a concern about the long-term economic costs of missing a chunk of the school year, or perhaps the worry about the very unequal access to education that the kids are experiencing under the lockdown. It is an entirely functionalist perspective that only takes into account the conditions for capitalist reproduction. What is remarkable is that the social and developmental needs of children, for example, for play, company and friendship, as well as the fundamental rights of children as persons, do not figure anywhere in these conversations. One of the further signs of the current moments is that many politicians deflect their responsibility for making decisions by suggesting that they merely follow the council of experts. The various lockdown measures are frequently presented as the only possible response to an overwhelming crisis. But this is a rhetorical shortcut in two ways. First, it manifests a language of deflection, according to which decisions are not actually political determinations because there is no alternative. This rhetoric is not, of course, new. It's a version of the mantra concerning the practical constraints of a capitalist economy operating under conditions of global competition that render illusory or utopian a structural transformation of the economy in a socialist direction or even just the social democratic expansion of free distributive social and economic programs. Yet the famous Thatcherite slogan, there is no alternative, is no less ideological when it is deployed in the face of a pandemic than when it is thrown in the face of movements that seek to bring about socio-economic transformation. While in the field of economic policy, neoliberals have been quite successful at realizing their long-standing dream of a government by expertise that is entirely shielded from democratic oversight. For now, epidemiologists do not have an equivalent influence on public health policy, nor should they. Political decisions require decision makers to take responsibility by being answerable and to analyze the situation by weighing trade-offs against one another. Experts are not well placed to perform either of these roles. The idea that the lockdown is the only possible response to the pandemic is a rhetorical shortcut in a second way, because the closures and restrictions are treated as self-evident responses to the threat of life posed by COVID-19 and not as requiring normative justification. Implicit here is the idea that the constitutional right to life is absolute and takes priority over all other rights. That logic has a certain basis in hegemonic popular discourse and also in constitutional and human rights jurisprudence, where the right to life is frequently regarded as a norm of use cogens. In other words, a peremptory norm that precedes and may avoid codified legal statutes in both domestic and international law. Use Kogan's norms are taken to apply by virtue of nature. In other words, there are norms of natural law. Yet once we understand the protection of life in terms of such an absolute right, we quickly enter a paradoxical tailspin. Because of the fundamental fact of human mortality, the right to life is aporetic. We all run the risk of death every day and face absolute certainty that one day will be our last. Moreover, it is unclear to what extent the right to life should take priority over all other, over all other rights and needs. For example, does the right to life, even in the absence of a pandemic, include a claim right and a correlative duty by society to infinite medical resources for the temporal extension of life? Without calling into question the current lockdowns, does the right to life of vulnerable groups involve a power to require the entire population to indefinitely isolate themselves at home so as to prevent transmission of a disease? These are extreme formulations, but they make clear that the right to life is not and cannot be absolute, and that it cannot have an unconditional priority over other fundamental rights and needs. My point is not that the restrictions are illegitimate, but rather that they involve a hard and difficult trade-off between different values and that their imposition and extension must be subject 
to ongoing democratic debate. That there are in fact trade-offs involved is unfortunately often blocked out from current discourse. While there are no doubt good reasons for the various restrictions that are in place, most obviously the need to prevent the collapse of the health systems, the moral outrage that's often directed against those who are calling lockdown measures into question is misplaced. It's a mistake to believe that on the one side of this quarrel are those who want to save lives and on the other side those who want to make money. The slogan, lives over profits, that is gaining currency in some quarters of the left, mischaracterizes the trade-offs involved. A democratic approach to these questions must acknowledge that these restrictions impose immense costs, social costs, economic costs, cultural, but also public health costs, including mental health, sexual health, women's health, on wide part of the population, and particularly working class. In fact, the language of costs is misleading because it suggests precisely that these harms can be easily weighed against expected benefits, which is not the case. In fact, the more serious problem with the knee-jerk mantra, lives over profits, is that in the name of a professed anti-capitalism, it calls for what is essentially an extended state-imposed lockout. Yet such measures in no way increase the agency and power of workers in the current conjuncture, nor do they yield the substantive versions of solidarity that are necessary for left organizing. And they tend to undermine, rather than support, the various movements of democratic contestation against autocratic governments, neoliberal policies, racializations of citizenship, militarization of borders, and the atrocious treatment of migrants. Solidarity, in fact, is one of the key words at the current moment. Many of the counter-epidemic measures are publicly presented as acts of solidarity, of those who are less vulnerable with populations that are more exposed and at risk, such as the elderly, those with pre-existing conditions, and so on. We are asked to show solidarity by staying at home and by complying with the physical distancing injunctions and by refraining from hoarding. In addition, governments are appealing to the public to help vulnerable neighbors and strangers. Local restaurants are asking patrons to place delivery orders. Airlines and travel agents are emailing and imploring their customers to forego refunds. Theaters, zoos, clubs, and even gyms are requesting donations, and so on. These appeals to solidarity are ambiguous. On the one hand, there is tremendous democratic potential in the practice of mutual aid and in the emerging neighborhood squads that provision those in need. These are important developments that prefigure alternative forms of sociality and communal organizations that are beyond the market and the state apparatus. On the other hand, the commodified, excuse me, the commodified nature of some of these acts of solidarity that we're enjoined to perform suggests that they're not based on a logic of community or reciprocity, but a desperate attempt to sanctify what were, until very recently, dispassionate economic transaction and to suddenly give them an aura of community. Or, put differently, their attempt to further monetize the affective, communicative, and emotional supplements in which post-Fordist capitalism has been trafficking for decades. The ambiguity is repeated on a transnational level. On the one hand, the provisions of necessary medical equipment, such as masks and respirators, by China or by Russia to those who need them. The willingness of Germany to open some of its hospital beds to patients from hotspots like Italy. Or the establishment by the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund of an endowment to aid the poorest countries to manage the emergency are badly needed signs of transnational solidarity. However, the small, minuscule scale at which these things take place raises the rather cynical question of whether they are anything more than PR moves. With respect to radical, revolutionary, and insurrectionary conceptions of democracy, ones that are based on the premise of the absolute autonomy of the demos and the people's right to give itself a constitution, to change its government, and to throw out its leaders. From that perspective, the current situation raises the further question 
of what the public and collective praxis of democratic contestation looks like under the pandemic. The basic idea of contestatory and insurrectionary praxis is that it represents an act of protest through which citizens make political demands. Implicit is that such demands represent a popular and democratic will that expresses collective self-determination. It is in the nature of such practices and of the constituent power that they presuppose that they arise in conflict with the constituted power of the state and its codified legal system. The very paradigm of constituent power is such that it represents an extra institutional force that interrupts the con constitutional continuity and introduces a break that can only justify itself with reference to a yet undetermined future. As such, contestatory and insurrectionary praxis typically involves unlawful protests, sometimes described as civil or uncivil disobedience. Under the lockdown measures, such collective acts of protest will be tricky from a public health perspective for some time to come. Moreover, it is likely that public support for unlawful demonstration and protest will dwindle even further. The tone of the media reports in the last few weeks about unauthorized political gatherings suggests that there will be little public backing for collective forms of contestation. And yet, I regard it as fundamentally important that the radical democratic left continues to make space for such protests and acts of disobedience. In this regard, there will be disagreements about what counts as civility under the pandemic and to what extent civility demands adherence to counter-epidemic measures.